Hi, University Talks audience. My name is Jessica Anderson, and I'm a first-generation college student and a recent graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. I majored in biology, and I concentrated in mechanisms of disease. I also minored in bioethics, and then I participated in research all four years of college. I selected the University of Pennsylvania not only because it offers a really exceptional education, but also I knew that I wanted a rigorous program because I was a very intense student in high school. So it was important for me to be surrounded by motivated people with the same kinds of interests as me. And I definitely found that at Penn. And I also found that Penn, for the most part, really welcomed that kind of attitude. However, I just want to point out that just because I found people like that doesn't mean that that's all the people at Penn or all the people in my program. So it was actually a surprise for me to learn that just like in high school, there's all kinds of different students with different goals and different reasons for being there. The teaching style was very two-dimensional. So in the beginning and in intermediate courses, they were fast paced. They were focused on really concisely lecturing a high level of detailed information. In the advanced courses, then there was more generally like a balance of lectures and discussions or some classwork in small groups. Evaluations in my major were entirely exam based. They're very systems focused. So though there's some courses that asked for just cold call rote memorization, most of the courses asked us to apply the detailed knowledge that we had acquired to answer these questions about what would happen directly or indirectly if a system component was disrupted. In courses that included experimental knowledge, we were also asked how to evaluate a hypothesis. So for example, how would we test the consequence of disrupting the system component that, of interest, whatever that may be. And there was really little to no homework in the beginning or intermediate or even the advanced coursework. And if there was homework, it really didn't count for much of the overall grade. I'm saying like less than 10%. We were generally graded on either a bell curve or a raw score. So a bell curve really just generally means that your grade is relative to your classmates performance. So if the mean on the exam for the class is 60%, then you'll be graded relative to that mean. And if you do two standard deviations above that, then you're guaranteed an A. A lot of times that can scare students, but in courses that are really difficult, it turns out to be a bit of an asset. The other option is being graded on a raw score, and that just means that a 93 to 100 is automatically an A, and that's kind of that. If half the class scores a 94, then half the class gets an A. I found it most helpful, no matter how the course was graded, really no matter how the course was taught, to study by writing out what I remember from lecture using schemes or graphics on a whiteboard. So by writing everything out, then I could remember, I was able to look back and figure out what I forgot. So this actually helped me study effectively because we tend to like to study the things that we know and we tend to not want to recognize the things that we don't know. But it was really important for me to force myself to rec recognize what I wasn't familiar with and then take the time to actually study that. I also used office hours, but that was really mostly only later in my college career. I definitely wish I would have done that earlier. University of Pennsylvania's biology program is really largely focused on teaching biology from the perspective of human biomedical disease. There are some ecology courses present. You might take a class or two that will talk about plants, um, but there really aren't that many. So there's also an extensive selection of genetics and molecular biology and cellular biology coursework, but there's fewer courses available in the upper levels that are focused on computational biology, physiology, evolution, or ecology. So as stated previously, these courses are all going to provide a high level of detailed knowledge, and they're all going to expect students to be able to produce a working knowledge at the end of the course. Generally, I would also say these are going to be research-focused courses, and this is a research-focused 
program. So if you want to get honors in the major, you have to complete at least one semester of research. So overall, if you're interested in human disease-oriented science, this program is great. If you're interested in agricultural science or animal science down the road, it just won't have as many opportunities for exposure. There's a lot of applicants every single year, and there really isn't any magic sauce that I can tell anybody for how to guarantee getting in. Generally, the students that are matriculating at Penn are having a 3.9 or higher GPA. The 25th to 75th like quartile for the ACT and SAT scores are 34 to 36, and then 1470 to 1550 respectively. So those are really high. It's really competitive. The ACT and the SAT are no longer required, but it's strongly encouraged that you try and take at least one of those tests anyway. You don't have to take both. I only took the ACT. There's no mandatory interview, but Penn really has a good interview matching rate. And so by that, it just means that if you want to get an interview in with an alumni, for example, myself, because I will be on the interview program, uh, then you have a really good chance of actually getting matched with someone and being able to complete that interview. Uh, an interview is, like I said, it's not mandatory. It doesn't help your chances of admission at all, but it is a really nice opportunity for you to have a one-in-one -on -one chance to have some very specific questions answered. Like most private colleges, the rate of admissions between the early decision applicants and the regular decision applicants is actually uh, pretty significantly different. The early decision applicants are individuals that are generally applying to Penn, I believe in November, which is ahead of the normal application deadline. And it's generally contract-based, meaning you apply early and you guarantee that if you get accepted, you will go. So they'll also get back to you before the admissions deadlines for all the other universities. So you're not going to miss your chance to apply to others if you don't get in at Penn. The admissions rate for early decision applicants is 19%. The Admissions rate for regular decision applicants, being those that are applying with everybody else in December, is 9%. So as you can see, if you apply in November and you sign a contract saying, if you accept me, I'll definitely go, it does increase your chance of admissions. That doesn't necessarily guarantee things, obviously, and no matter if you apply early or if you apply regular decision, you're going to want to make sure that your application is as strong as possible. And part of that is checking the boxes get the test scores that you need, get the GPA that you need, and then you know also involve yourself in extracurriculars. Show that you can be a leader, show that you have interests, that you are interested in intersectionality of different fields, and then if you have something that you're really passionate about, use it to make yourself stand out. No matter what that thing is, if it's a sport, if it's just an interest, use that because that's something that's true to your personality and true to you that someone else might not have. And it helps the application committee really look at you as a person. And since Penn is need blind, really financial aid is probably the least stressful part about the application. So in my experience, I just needed to submit a FAFSA so that's the federal student aid paperwork in the United States. And then a CSS profile, which is something that's done through a private company, but also something that I believe might be specific to the United States. I had to submit both of those documents that are generally sharing my family's financial means. And then I submitted those to Penn along with my application and they were able to provide me with really all the money that I needed to be able to attend debt free. The average cost of attendance at Penn, so the cost of textbooks and rent and tuition and all of that stuff clocks in at about $73,000 a year but the average financial aid package is $54,000. So as you can see, uh, it really is a substantial amount of financial aid. In high school, I would say just take as many advanced courses as you can, whether they're in biology or chemistry, the humanities, statistics, physics, all of it. It'll all really prepare you for both 
the STEM majors at Penn and also the humanities requirements at Penn. Because even though my major was biology, I still had to take some courses in sociology and history because Penn is based off of a liberal arts curriculum. Specific to my major though, at the university, I really recommend that students try and take Biology 446 with Dr. Joshua Plotkin, and then Biology 447 with Dr. Wood, and then Biology 221. Those are three courses that I think you should really try and take at least your sophomore year because they're pertaining to statistics, data analysis, and molecular biology respectively. And they're really by far the three most useful courses I ever took at Penn if you're interested in doing research. But if you're not, then really I would just say generally take things in order of the like level of difficulty of the material. So intro, then intermediate, then advanced. There's one course though that I don't recommend that uh, most people take, and that is Biology 121, which is an introductory biology course that's compressed into one semester. So the normal trajectory of introductory biology at Penn is uh, two semesters, Biology 101 and 102. And I took that course and I had a lot of difficulty. I had a public high school background from rural Iowa and I did not feel adequately prepared and I didn't feel adequately supported. Therefore, I would just very much caution that anybody who doesn't have an experience with AP Biology maybe specifically a five on the AP Biology test, seriously reconsider whether or not that's the best choice for you in your academic plan. At Penn, you pre-register for courses, meaning you submit a wish list schedule, and then about two weeks later, you are given a variation of that schedule back. Maybe the algorithm finds that all other courses that you signed up for are available, in which case you just receive the schedule just as you submitted it. Alternatively, you might find that some courses ended up full and you weren't able to get into them. So at this time, then it turns into a first come, first serve. As some people drop a course, you can try and get into it. It's all just clicking, you know, trying to enroll and then trying to get notifications for when a course opens up. I will say that I have never had an issue trying to get into courses that were requirements for my major or really even courses that I just found interesting. My strategy was pretty simple, so if I needed the course and it was small in size, meaning that it could fill up, then I just put that as the highest priority when I was submitting my wish list schedule. If something was a large course, even if it was something that was required for my major, if it was large and I didn't think that it was going to fill up, it went as the lowest priority course on my schedule wish list. My friends and I all pretty much ended up in one of three different career paths. Either we went directly into graduate school, whether that's getting a PhD, a master's, or an MD, or we all entered into a gap year, which is not purgatory, although I'd like to make a little bit of a joke about it. Um, it's really just a year or two or three in which you're finding something to do with your time. Generally, it's actually research, but it can be anything you want it to be. And you're using that time to study for the medical college admissions test or the GRE or whatever it is that you feel that you need to prepare in order to apply to graduate school. And then the third trajectory was actually consulting. And Penn has a remarkable talent for making consultants out of anybody. And that's not a bad thing, it's just a really thing, I think it's a thing that's very specific to Penn. So consulting is uh, generally a field in which you are hired based on your expertise to do problem solving for different companies. So as you might have noticed, two of the three things are going into higher education. And that is something that you should really know before you consider a biology major. There's not a lot you can do with just your BA in biology. If you want to teach in college, that's going to be getting a PhD. If you want to teach in high school, then you're going to have to make sure that you actually take courses in undergrad that allow you to get your teaching licensure at the end of college. And Penn doesn't offer that. So if you want to teach high school biology, you can't go to Penn for that, to my knowledge. So just keep all of that in mind. 
A lot of times people talk about how should I prepare if I want to go into graduate school. At Penn, research is pretty much a mandate. You have to do at least a semester or a summer. Normally, if you're just interested in an MD, then you can get away with one summer, and if you don't like it, you can never do it again. If you're interested in going into a PhD, though, so you know, making a career out of research, then really the more the merrier. As a pre-med and STEM major, I definitely didn't have a lot of experience in these things, I'd say, but Penn is known for its party and drinking culture. It's difficult to escape that, really, no matter what groups you involve yourself in. And Penn has been nicknamed the Social Ivy for a reason, because people are really fond of the saying, work hard, play hard. There's a famous bar on campus called Smokes, and people frequently go to the parties um, in clubs downtown called Center City, Philadelphia. About a third of Penn undergraduates are involved in some kind of Greek life. Penn is pretty unique in that it not only has a really strong group of sororities and fraternities for men and women respectively, but it has pre-professional and co-ed groups that are really serious about helping you connect with peers of similar interests. For example, some pre-medical groups are able to organize shadowing opportunities in the hospital through the established relationships that they have with doctors. And then, of course, there's also a ton of university uh, sanctioned intramural sports and passion groups. I mean, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of service opportunities and games and pre-professional competitions. Penn has a Student Activities Council page, also known as SAC, and you can look up the directory for all of this. And then lastly, I would add that Penn does do international exchanges, study abroad. In my junior year, three quarters of my friends actually went abroad. I myself never personally did, but it's really very common and a lot of people do it their junior year. I would say that the university is quite diverse. Of course, I come from rural Iowa and my metric is way off compared to a lot of people. But admission statistics report that 54% of the class of 2024 self-identified as students of color and then 10% of the students are international. There's also 53% of the student body is female. And then even in my program, I had multiple female professors and I had some professors associating with underrepresented minorities. So I do feel quite strongly that Penn has a not only diverse programs in terms of gender and ethnicity, but also in terms of student background and in terms of culture. So I really enjoyed my time there in large part for that reason. Penn also has a lot of support services. So there's free counseling, there's multiple cultural groups, that are really in, created by the university to provide solidarity for students from varied backgrounds. So for example, there's a women's building, a women's center, and then an LGBTQ center. There's also a first generation low income college student center, and they're really well resourced and they're really great, well-organized, supportive group for anybody identifying as either first-generation or low-income. I'll also say Career Services is, it was a huge help in preparing for job interviews, um, job interview materials, getting all those together, looking all of those over for me, and also graduate school applications. We also have Weingarten Learning Resource Center, and that is meant to help students essentially learn how to learn because the learning process is really different between high school and college. They also exist to accommodate testers with special needs, such as those with ADHD. So the first thing I would really say strongly is you should go to office hours. You shouldn't be ashamed to ask questions. You should surround yourself with people that share your values and motivate you to feel comfortable in your journey know that those people don't have to be in your major. Go to Wine Garden <laughs> at least once to You cannot give up your hope. 
your drive and your belief in yourself. Penn is going to be very different than what a lot of students have experienced in high school. And we all come with a different